Thanks, Marty. Uh, it, uh, I'm not sure why we stuck an economist after a bunch of artists talking about joy, but I'll, I'll try and I'll try and bring down the room here at lunchtime. Um, uh, yeah, so um, you know, I've titled this talk "The Economy is Going Crazy: What Is Happening?" because, well, the economy is going crazy, and there's a lot happening. Um, so let's try and walk through at least some of the high-level stuff that that's 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 happening out there. Um, you know, you've probably seen various headlines like this one, labor shortage, Missoula businesses struggle to find workers, Missoula housing prices surge as out-of-state buyers flock here. Maybe you've seen stuff like this, you know, uh, used car prices are up 50% and lumber prices are up 50%. Um, there's a lot of crazy stuff happening in the economy. Um, and so, you know, what's, what's driving all this? And it's worth to understand what's happening now, what's worth going back um, 14 months to the start of the pandemic. And, you know, this was the chart that I used to present uh, back uh, back then, which is basically, look, this is what we were trying to do from an economic policy perspective, right? There's three things that had to happen. One was, look, we had to shut stuff down because of a communicable disease. Uh, people had to, you know, stop interacting in the way they normally did uh, to protect, you know, life and health. And so that was kind of baked in. But then we were trying to do two other things. One, we were trying to make sure that you know firms didn't go out of business, uh, you know things didn't, you know, our productive capacity didn't shrink, and we also wanted to make sure that households had enough money so that when they could come back and merge like we are now from the pandemic, that they had money in their pockets, they hadn't gone under, um, and so that they could go and support the businesses that we'd preserved. And we did actually a reasonably good job of this, right? You know, this wasn't a normal recession; it's a natural disaster. Um, and you know, to the extent that we've experienced gum in the works, it's largely been fundamentally about the disaster part, the fear of the virus. And you know, here we are now trying to emerge. And you know, is it going uh, perfectly smoothly? No, um, but it's probably going about as well as we could expect, given what we've been through and you know what we didn't know at the time. So, what's exactly happened? Well, first, income has exploded uh, in 2020. Uh, personal income in Montana grew by 8.4%. That's four and a half billion dollars. Um, if you just look at total earnings from work in the fourth quarter, they are up 7% year over year. And that's in spite of the fact that employment was down. Um, so people in Montana, they've got more money in their pocket uh, than they used to have. And then not only did we get more money, but because of the pandemic, many of us didn't spend as much. And so what we were spending actually went down. And so more income, less spending means a lot more savings. So the personal savings rate nationally increased from 8% to 19%. Um, and, you know, and we can see that there's evidence that people have less debt because the amount of money that they're spending on interest, uh, non-mortgage interest has actually fallen by 27%, right? So household balance sheets in aggregate are pretty good. Um, you know, and when you have household balance sheets in aggregate are pretty good, we see less hardship, less food insecurity, less problems paying bills, less utility shutoffs, less problems paying rent, uh, problems paying medical bills or, you know, unmet need. All of that fell in 2020 relative to 2019. Now, again, that's all in aggregate. It's worth noting that the pandemic was very uneven and unequal. So there was a group of people, particularly people who lost a job or were furloughed, you know, obviously their hardships all increased and they were much, much higher than the rest of the population. So, you know, while I'm going to talk a lot in aggregate terms, I don't want to ignore the equity issues um, that were, you know, uh, exacerbated by the pandemic. Um, but in aggregate, in terms of what's driving the aggregate economic narrative, 2020 was a reasonably good year in part because of federal transfer payments and in part, at least in Montana, because wages went up. Now, the other big change that came from the pandemic is we've shifted our consumption, right? When you're afraid of the virus, you don't go out and consume various face-to-face -face services, but people with money, they tend to like to spend it. And so what do they do? They went out and bought goods. Um, you know, so what this chart shows is, you know, it's GDP through the first quarter of 2021, imagining that we continued to grow at the pace we were growing pre-pandemic, and this is the deviation from that level. And we can see that things like recreational goods are more than 25% up above what we would have expected without a pandemic. 
but recreational services are down 31%. And you can kind of see in, in the, you know, there's a whole bunch of stuff in the middle, but basically goods are, are, have grown, services have shrunk, but services are trying to recover, right? So here's spending uh, in Montana, and we can see that total spending is already above the pre-pandemic level. Um, but, you know, spending at things like restaurants and hotels, it kind of bounced back over the summer, but kind of flatlined through most of the rest of the year. But as we got into February and more people got vaccinated, we've started to see that start creeping back up. It's still down, uh, or at least it was as of a month ago, um, but it's getting closer to, you know, recovering to the pre-pandemic level. So what does that all mean? That means there's lots of demand. People have money, they're trying, they're looking to spend it, and firms are trying to ramp up supply to meet that demand. But we're trying to do it all at once while there's still a pandemic, not just in the US, but all across the globe. And so we've got kind of messes all over the place, right? And this is what you're seeing in the news media, and this is why people think the economy is going crazy. It's because there's demand that's trying to be met with supply, but there's still a pandemic and the after effects of the pandemic and it's going to take more than a few weeks to kind of put this behind us. It's going to take us months to kind of get things, get all the sand out of the gears uh, and get our get our machinery working uh, as efficiently as it, you know, we're used to it working. So what's what are all the different sands in the gears? Well, first, there's just supply chain issues. Uh, as of mid-April, half of Montana businesses were reporting some form of delay, either a supplier delay or a shipping delay. Um, and they're particularly common in industries like construction, manufacturing, wholesale trade, and retail trade. And in addition, 35% of Montana businesses also reported that their operating capacity, how much they could produce, was down relative to the pre-pandemic levels due to lack of supplies, lack of employees, or distancing measures that they were still following. So, you know, our capacity is not quite what it was just in terms of just the efficient operating of the economy. Um, you know, and part of this also is just People guessed wrong. Um, you know, when the when the pandemic first hit, um, people, a lot of industries were like, "Ooh, a big recession's coming. We got to pull back. We got to cut back our capacity, cut back on our output, uh, cut back on our orders." And we're seeing some of the after effects of that. So, for instance, um, timber production in the early part of the pandemic fell. Um, demand only fell a little bit, and then now it's much much higher. And so, you know, that that lack of production, the you know, the fact that we didn't build up inventories over that period. Um, now we're paying a price because there's not as much lumber as there may have been without the recession. And you may have been hearing a lot about uh, auto manufacturers who are having to, you know, furlough workers because they don't have chips to put in their cars. Well, part of that was because at the beginning of the recession, they assumed that orders were going to fall. So they ordered less of the chips that they need. And now they're at the back of the line waiting for, for production to catch up. And so, you know, there's just sand in the gears in terms of just the linkages uh, uh, between, you know, different parts of the supply chain. Um, but then also there's just issues on the worker side. And in Montana, at least, uh, you know, according to the, the job posting service Indeed, job postings are up 44% relative to pre-pandemic levels, and that's all seasonally adjusted. So we're, you know, we're accounting for the fact that we normally hire more workers this time of year. Um, so there's a lot of demand for workers here from, in, from Montana firms, but there's just not a ton of extra workers uh, for the, to take those jobs. Uh, employment in Montana, at least as of mid-March, had mostly recovered. So statewide, we were at 99% of the um, pre-pandemic level, so that's about 5,600 jobs down. Uh, Missoula's been a little slower. All the, all the data for Missoula are a little bit noisier, so it's harder to interpret. Um, so employment had almost recovered. The unemployment rate had recovered to the pre-pandemic level, uh, you know, or almost exactly to the pre-pandemic level. Um, you know, labor force participation was slightly down, so there is technically maybe a little slack in the, in the labor market. Um, although a large portion of that decline is at least it appears to be attributable to lingering fears of the virus. So this thing called the household pulse, pulse survey that the census puts out, um, it asks people why they're not at work. And as of mid-April, 9,000 Montanans or roughly 9,000 Montanans said that they weren't at work because they're still afraid of the virus or spreading the virus. And an additional 9,000 indicated that they weren't at work because of childcare. 
which is still, you know, has not recovered from the pandemic. Either you put your kid in online only or you didn't get a spot, you know, in, in, in a daycare center or a child care center that had reduced capacity. And so there's still some lingering issues um, that are, you know, kind of directly pandemic related that we're going to have to work through over the next few months. Um, but there's also this discussion that's ongoing about unemployment insurance. You know, um, uh, it is more generous than it's used when we're, than we're used to. And, you know, nationally, about 50 percent of workers uh, can make more than their pre-pandemic wage by remaining on unemployment. So it certainly seems plausible and perhaps likely that at least some portion of, you know, the, you know, of the people that are on unemployment might otherwise be in the labor force. It's not clear exactly how many or how big that problem is, but it's certainly one of the things that is likely contributing to, uh, you know, a perceived shortage of workers here in Montana. Um, you know, we'll learn more over the next month because all of those data are really about what's happening six months, six weeks ago. Um, so, you know, we'll learn more about where we were in Montana over the next month. And this morning we got the national jobs report, which tells us at least something about two and a half weeks ago. Uh, and it was all over the place. It did not provide a lot of clarity. Uh, it showed slower total employment growth seasonally adjusted. It was big up in the industry that's been complaining the most about the lack of workers, leisure and hospitality. Um, but it was actually down in manufacturing and trade and transportation and professional business services, which it was it mostly driven by a decline in, in temporary workers. So we have got a hot and cold indicators there. We've got people that were working part time for economic reasons. So they wanted to work full time, but, you know, there wasn't work for them. All that they shrunk by a ton. So that well, that suge you know, suggests that the labor market's hot. Um, but we also managed to draw in an enormous amount of people out of out of out of into the labor force, but it was entirely men. Um, actually, women's labor force participation declined. Um, so that's puzzling, but it's also consistent with there being a lot of slack in the labor force. So the short version is, is the picture still fuzzy? We don't really know exactly where we are at this moment. Um, is demand not as hot as we thought? Are there supply currents still binding? Um, is this just about transitions? It just takes time to hire a bunch of people. And when, uh, you hear stories about lots of people needing workers. Maybe you're like, oh, well, I, now is the time to switch uh, and people are quitting and they're not getting filled as much. So it's going to take several months for this to all shake out. But, you know, the short version is, is that the labor market's still kind of wonky. But in Montana, at least, we're pretty close to recovered and we're trying to grow. Another part of our problem, you know, in that case, for a big part of our problem here is that we also then normal under normal circumstances in montana we import part of our labor force that is our population grows every year at least some of those people that move here every year are workers and you know so it's very normal for montana firms or missoula firms to bring in workers from outside to satisfy the growing demand for the economy um but now we have a problem in that we have no houses available um you know, uh, and as a result of that, housing prices have exploded, right? So here's some data um, from Zillow, uh, which goes through the end of March. And as of uh, the end of March during the pandemic, so from February 2020 to March 2021, house prices in Missoula grew by 18%, um, which is the 27th fastest amongst all metro and micro areas uh, in the country. Um, so, you know, uh, that's down a little bit from Bozeman, which was seventh, or Boise, which was first, or Kalispell, which was 18th. But, um, you know, it represents a, a big change for Missoula. You know, we were fast in the pre-pandemic period, but we were 259th uh, over the five years prior to the pandemic. So there's been this huge increase in housing prices, um, you know, across Montana, but in particular in Bozeman, Kalispell, Missoula, and Helena. Um, you know, and what's driving that? Well, a lot of that is there's just not very many houses on the market. Now, in total, the blue line here, that's year to date sales through April. You can see that in 2021, we're actually up relative to 2019. Um, you know, so there still are houses that are selling. But if you look at how many houses are actually on the market, we're down to 78. Whereas, you know, say five years ago in April, we would have had 300. Um, so, you know, houses, they're going in the market, they're selling very fast. And so there's just not, when somebody shows up and says, hey, I'd like to move here, 
or hey, I'd like to you know change my housing situation. There's not a lot to choose from, so that bring drives up their feeling of scarcity. That drives up what they bid. It drives up housing prices. So what? what how does this all work? So let's we'll, we'll just walk through the basic supply and demand side, right? So uh, on the demand side, demand basically stems from first we have well, how many households are there? Um, and so we have you know how many households we started with, and then we have household formation, right? So that's when you know people who used to live with roommates they spit off, they get married, they get a new, they create a new household, or uh, children who used to live with their parents they leave the nest and they form a new household, or you know other families they 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 give up a house and they move back in uh, with some other family members and that reduces a household. So you know we start with a total number of households and household formation has gone up during the pandemic. That may be a reflection of higher income. It may be a reflection that lower interest rates make it a, an appealing time to buy. And it's also just the fact that, you know, the largest uh, age cohort in the country is like 29 and entering the peak household formation years. Um, there's also maybe some pandemic related reasons like uh, families spreading out so that, you know, you're not putting a, a, a worker who's in, uh, you know, a, a, a high risk job uh, that's not living, no longer living with grandma. Um, but there's also policies that have presented, you know, some net declines in household formation, like, you know, policies that reduce evictions and foreclosure. So all of this means that, you know, the net number of households has risen. Um, so there's more demand for housing. And that's just, that's nationally the aggregate amount. And then we say, well, how is it being allocated across place, you know? And so obviously Missoula appears, you know, that 18% means, suggests that there's an increase in demand for Missoula. And that can reflect people who want to live here. And there's two types of people who want to live here. There's people who can live anywhere. Their income isn't tied to place, right? So they care about quality of life, cost of living. Um, they're not really interested in jobs here. So either they're people who have, they're retired, they have trust funds uh, or capital income, or they can work from anywhere. And so that's part of the story of Missoula. We have a larger share of that group than most places do. Um, and then there's also the people who like to want to just live here and have a local job. And then we also have an additional part where we have people who live here seasonally or come here and rent short-term rentals and all of those people also consume our housing stock. So then what's happening on the supply side? Well, supply is just the number of occupied units, the number of vacant units and how many we're creating. Um, and you know, growing demand means that you soak up vacancies and hopefully you would spur net creation. Um, and you encourage people to build, but it takes time to build. And so, you know, in the short run, we basically just soak up vacancies and vacancies have plummeted. Um, so relative to pre-pandemic homeowner vacancy rates in Montana are almost a third of what they were. Um, and, you know, renter vacancies are somewhere down between 30 to 50 percent. Um, we are trying to build more, um, but, you know, building, you know, at least in terms of how many housing permits or, or building permits are getting uh, uh, filed uh, with the county, they're up, um, but they're still not reaching the peaks of, you know, either even just a few years ago, but and certainly not reaching the levels that we saw prior to the Great Recession. So, you know, in some sense, it would be nice to be able to get that building up to try and address some of this. So how do we get out of it? Well, we can hope that demand goes away. That's not ideal, but if prices keep rising, that will happen. People will be pushed out. And it's worth noting that those who are pushed out are different um, than those, or don't come in the first place, are different than those who remain or come, right? So this is the story of California, which is, you know, has had much slower population growth, much faster housing price growth. And what's lurking underneath that is an out migration of people with lower incomes and in migration of people with higher incomes. And so, you know, there's this California, California, Californification uh, that we may see, or we have already seen to some degree in Montana. Um, so, you know, that's one process. You just let prices rise, let demand settle down, um, and just change the composition of who lives here. The other option is to boost supply, right? And we can reduce vacancies by having people sell off second homes. We can buy in families and take the money and wait to buy later, or we can build more. But building more is also controversial because there's only two options. We can densify and change neighborhood character, or we can sprawl and consume more of, you know, the areas outside of town. And, you know, here in Missoula, we have a problem in that we actually don't have much ability to sprawl. We have some, but, you know, this figure here shows, com compares a, a 50 kilometer radius around Missoula and Dallas. If you look at the Dallas graph or figure, 
almost all of the land within 50 kilometers of downtown Del Dallas is developable. It's like 97% of the land is developable. Uh, here in Missoula, we have these big giant mountains that kind of get in the way. And then you also have floodplains that also get in the way. And so there's just not a ton of empty space. And so choosing the sprawl option to deal with our, our, our limited housing supply isn't probably going to work very well. Um, so that really pushes us towards, well, we got to choose either to densify or just to let prices rise and let people change. Um, so um, I think I'll stop there and let Marcy ask me questions um, so that, uh, you know, we get at least a little bit of that. Um, Hi. So do you have any questions for me, Marcy? I do. Sorry. Can we bring him in just on video? Like, or is he only on share? That's on his end of things. Okay. I, I don't know how to switch that, I guess. I um, can try. Well, here. Bryce, I, I, I know you started with a share screen. Yeah, I don't know if I can. Doesn't okay. look like so, I can. Stop share. All right. You have to switch to his left channel. Um, he has okay, to switch stop share. Does that work? I stopped sharing, okay. but I don't see how to turn my video on. Okay. So just ask me the question and people can I look at a blank we won't, we screen. I won't get to see your face. So <laughs> uh, I'm so curious. Uh, one of the things that really stuck out to me was um, you mentioned both uh, sort of uh, women's uh, employment um, still being down. Um, and then you also mentioned that, oh, there you are. Hi. There I am. There you are. Um, you also mentioned that uh, the uh, 9,000 people in Montana talked about not being going back to work because of childcare issues. And so I'm wondering how closely those are tied and that 9,000 number that you stated, do we know if those are women or men that answered that question? Um, I, we could look it up. I don't know it off the top of my head. Um, uh, it's likely mostly women just based on what we know um so what was the first part of your question i i, I forgot it well you talked well so you talked a little bit about um employment numbers and the decline in employment and the, that there was significant a more significant de decline in employment among women than there were men and that we've seen employment climb back up but still women are are lagging behind in that and so i'm just curious about the child care i'm also curious like do we know if people socially have um just made decisions to have different priorities because of the pandemic you know like maybe they live with a little less money and they want to spend more time with their family do we do we have surveys or statistics out there that um <laughs> Um, certainly we have anecdotes that support that. Um, and some of the patterns we're seeing in the data may also support that. Yeah, but, um, I haven't, we don't, the, you know, the main survey that's kind of ongoing, the household poll survey doesn't ask that specific question. It just asks, well, I just don't want to work. Um, or it gives you other things like, you know, childcare or whatever it is. But, uh, I, it's enough of a hypothesis that I certainly imagine that somebody will look into it. And, you know, I've been doing focus groups um, with employers for the past few weeks, and I've certainly heard anecdotes of that. Um, you know, people saying, yeah, somebody just came in and quit, said they can't deal with this anymore. Um, they're just going to go change their life. Um, so, you know, how big is that? I don't know. Um, in a country of 330 million or in a state of 1.1 million, um, uh, certainly if we dig hard enough, we will find some number of people that, have changed what they want out of life because of the pandemic. And that may change their relationship to what type of job they want, how much they want to work, um, whether they want to work at all. Uh, so yeah, certainly all of those things are part of the decline in labor force participation that, that at least appears to be persisting. Um, yeah. Well, I, I mean, it, I think it's it's interesting. I think that there is this great shift and I don't think, like I, I like that you talk about, um, you talked about several different reasons for um, people not going back to work. And um, so I don't think it's one, you know, some people are saying it's one thing or the other and, and, I, and I don't necessarily agree with that. There's so many variables out there. 
look, it's a big country. There's there's all, there's there's certainly evidence to support all of the different people who have made arguments for the most part. Um, and we have a problem in that we always want to simplify everything into a single story. Um, but we're in the midst of a, an unprecedented economic period. And it's very likely that there is more than one thing happening simultaneously. And so um, it's worth keeping that in mind and let this be a moment for nuance as hard as that might, you might find that. Yeah. Um, my other question is, are we going to see a huge surge in recreational goods uh, resale <laughs> for us that <laughs> like to buy secondhand boats and campers? <laughs> That was certainly my prediction last summer. Um, yeah. You know, you saw, uh, you know, a you saw that there was nothing available. You saw all the new ones out on the road, um, and it was like, well, in two years, when all the people who bought these things, you know, basically they they took the money that they used to spend on their big vacation and they yeah. bought an RV or a boat, um, and then in two years when they're like getting on an airplane again and not using the boat, um, you got to imagine that. Um, there's going to be a some amount of uh, opportunity. Um, so you know, if you can wait, you know, this is basically a, a general message that I was going to get to, but I didn't. Right. So yeah. if you have something that you're not currently using, uh -huh. now's the time to sell it. Sell it because yeah. it's a seller's market for bikes, boats, cars. Um, you know, you you can probably get a lot more money houses. than you would the houses. Uh, so if you can economize, if you can basically say, well, I've got a bike that I'm not using and I don't use that much, can I probably make it a year or two years uh, without a bike or six months without a bike? Uh, you can probably make uh, back some of what you you know paid for it by selling it right now and you can help alleviate some of the craziness in the market. Um, if you have a house, if you have an extra house, maybe go live in your extra house and sell this one. Uh, go live with your children if you like them enough. Um, you know, it, the, it's a great time to cash out of durables that you're not using a ton of. Uh, the problem with being an affluent society is that many of us are like, well, I only use it twice, but who cares? Uh, I don't need to sell it to make the money. But, um, you know, let me encourage you to at least think about it and you can help yeah. alleviate some of these shortages that we're currently dealing with. Yeah, I mean, we, we've been car shopping and that, that has been a crazy experience. Um, well, so my next question is, you know, so I feel like the house, the, so I'm trying to understand the housing market and you talked a little bit about that demand going up the household numbers, like the actual household numbers, right? So like, yeah. that means like people are roommates and then they get married and they become three households instead of one. But yep. so I feel like nationally the demand has gone up. I mean, my brother lives in Vermont, their house has gone up. I don't know. It's almost like doubled in price in the last two years. Um, and so I feel like there's a demand everywhere. Are we just like, is our, are we having like this explosion of, um, you know, 20, 30 year olds that are all of a sudden like spawning off into their own houses or what, what's going on? Um, I, you know, so certainly we've seen in, an increase in household formation. Um, at least some of that was expected, right? The mm -hmm. biggest cohort in the country is 25 to 29. Um, that's the age at which you start, stop, you know, you stop living with four roommates and you start living with a wife or a, a husband or a partner or, um, you know, so we, ex I expected that there was going to be a boost in demand for housing, um, just because of demographic factors. That was already baked in pre-pandemic. Now the pandemic did a couple of things. First, it lowered interest rates and that made it a really good time to try and say, well, now's the time to buy because you can lock in a, a much lower principal and interest payment. Um, and so that drove up housing prices. Houses up, you know, nationally house prices are up 10% or maybe a little bit more by now, 11%, I think. Um, and, you know, so that's every, you know, it's not everywhere that's experiencing that, but that's the average or, you know, across the country. Um, and that's mostly, I think, just the demographics, um, the low interest rates, you know, this boost in household formation. And then there's some, there are some supply side issues in terms of, um, you know, people not changing up some of their housing arrangements as much, um, mm -hmm. either because they're, 
not being kicked out because they're being evicted or foreclosed upon, uh, because they're not moving into uh, retirement homes. So one of the big, the, one of the biggest declines that we saw in the employment report today was in healthcare, which was driven entirely by uh, retirement homes. Like they were, employment was down like 20,000, which is a big decline in that industry. So, you know, there may be just some things like that that aren't happening, um, you know, but there's, you know, those are all national forces. So there's some big changes happening nationally. Um, but in high amenity areas, particularly in the Mountain West, something else is happening, right? Because, you, you know, you look at Boise um, at 30% growth since the pandemic started, um, you know, Bozeman, Kalispell, Missoula, all right around 20% growth since the pandemic started. Um, you know, and you know, I can just draw a map, but it's basically the entire, it's, you know, Idaho, Montana, Utah, um, and you know, parts of Oregon, parts of Washington, you know, those are all the places that are really at the top. And you know, those are all places, it's highly correlated with what was happening before. It's just supercharged, um, presumably because of people spreading out uh, of big central cities that are looking, you know, urban amenities became less desirable, natural amenities became more desirable, and there's some just general spreading out that appears to be happening and driving up prices. Whether or not we get an increase in population depends on how much supply we had that was vacant. Yeah. Well, gosh, I could sit here and talk to you for an hour, but um, we're out of time. Um, <laughs> I have I have a lot more questions. Maybe we should do another one just on like aging and what that means for Missoula, because I know that's like one of the few demographics that's actually growing in our community here. So um, and we have a shortage of care facilities. And um, yeah, it's definitely um, a, a topic that might be an interesting conversation. Well, Bryce, thank you so much for shedding light again on where we're at and um, thanks for all you do and um, all you've done to kind of keep us abreast to what's happening in our community. And I really enjoy, if you enjoy Bryce and listening to Bryce, um, he is often uh, on uh, the New Angle podcast with Justin Angle and they usually have some great conversations. Um, they had a more in-depth one about affordable housing recently. Go check it out, New Angle podcast. Um, thanks, Bryce, for being with us, and um, thanks for participating in Missoula Gives. All right. Thanks. Happy to be here. Yeah.